Hello, this is Clemency Burton Hill. Uh, you Hi. just saw her on the video. <laughs> and this is Molly. I mean, as we. Yeah, thank you. Thank I mean, you for that. Thank I mean, you for that. Thank you for that. Um, Clemmy and I know each other from uh, radio work. So Clemmy is sort of this heralded journalist, um, definitely at the BBC, and then walked into my life at New York Public Radio, where I work at Radio Lab. And, uh, and so sort of we've been like in and out of touch and on various journeys that have brought us back and forth together. And so we get to be here. This is the first time seeing each other since the pandemic. So we're excited to share this moment with you. Um, and we just thought it was a great way to kind of kick off what was happening today because music is such a integral part of your life. Um, and one of the things that I think about a lot after you had your hemorrhage was just how your relationship to music evolved. Like I feel like at some level uh, people were like, oh, it's so amazing that you were a musician because it can help you through this experience. And at another level, you had like a really personal reaction to like, no, I don't want to play the violin right now, or it feels hard. It wasn't that I don't, didn't want to play the violin. It was like, it's still totally impossible. Um, but um, sort of going back to the, when I woke up a bit after this coma, and, um, you know, my whole life obviously has been upended. Um, and it took a long time to sort of actually understand that that had actually happened. I mean, I, I'd been in a, a meeting, it was um, MLK Day. Mm -hmm. um, I should have been not at work, but I was like, I am a, like, a, workaholic mm -hmm. so I was like mm -hmm. great we have a day off let's go and do a work meeting <laughs> so um this is how Clemmy rolled all every day all the time yeah um but it was such it was so interesting it was I was you know going to have a recce or in in my language we'd say a record I don't know if, if um uh, yeah. you know I was going to find this um you know, interesting space for a conversation and concert series that would then have a podcast element. So, but a very different audience, it, classical music, but very, you know, not stuffy and, sorry, I hate to say that, I hate that word <laughs> so much because people think it, and it, we all know it's not actually stuffy, but lots of the audience, some, you know, all that stuff. <laughs> anyway, so so um, that's a no one in this room. That's a different <laughs> conversation, and I definitely w w want to have it. Um, but uh, so I was, you know, running around that morning, like any sort of normal, mm -hmm. normal parent. You know, the scramble. You know, oh God, it's a public holiday what's oh oh my god the kids can't go to school like oh like you know okay my husband's amazing uh he's gonna go take them to the uh, science center and i'll go to brooklyn do a quick um meeting and then we'll switch around <laughs> yeah. that was the end of my former life yeah and in terms of music you know, when I was in my former life, I would say this all the time, probably annoyingly, like music is going to save us. You know, music is everything. You know, everything, whether it's politics or healing of, you know, strife, or I had, you know, you know, difficult things in my life before. It's not like I'm, you know, was a gilded uh, person and then suddenly this catastrophe before me. But, but though I really truly believed that music was the end of, like, 
like when everything else failed, music was still there. Mm -hmm. And it was so, almost the, the worst music thing of all of this was that I couldn't find my way back mm -hmm. to music. I couldn't, you know, cognitively, neurologically, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, obviously people are very well-meaning and so they say, oh, Clemmy loves music, so, mm -hmm. you know, she probably wants the, like, new, uh, new the music therapist from the hospital to come round doing come by ya in the, the um, you know, um, guitar. And I was found, obviously, as a British, I was, I was so sorry, but I also couldn't speak. So I, it was like torture mm -hmm. on so many levels. And um, one, was that one of the things I was thinking about last night, um, and actually my unbelievable, heroic neurosurgeon who I was with just this week, um, uh, that he now says that we're um, implicating, <laughs> that's, that's the wrong word, sorry, um, in, in per, <laughs> this is it. And this is you. Uh, he, you are like form. You're form formulating. You're, no, like you're, no, no. He's already doing it in the hospital. Oh, they're implementing. Yes, thank you. We're implementing um, that um, that that we know now that it's not just therapy in a sort of nice. You know, maybe there's going to be a nice little. Um, you know, I'm sorry. It's not about. Can buy yeah. I mean, it's, it's everyone's favorite thing. That's also fine, but it's it was. It's a, I was trying to explain that I needed much more, and I knew that music could be more, b be mm. more, and provide it. Mm. And and I feel when Dr. Kellner said this last week. You know, over the last two years, I've been trying to put, make, make sure that music, because of the brain science and the like hard science, will that we now know about music and the brain and healing. And I was like, oh my God, it was almost worth it. <laughs> When so he said to, that. to make sure I understand this, you're saying that Sorry. that he no 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 you're saying that that he says that that now as a surgeon he's like somehow using music, either going into a surgery with a patient or coming out of a surgery as like recovery with a patient, largely based on experiences with you. Yes, and that um, he believes, as I do, um, that. You know, we don't know yet why I have survived and recovered as much as I have. Um, and, you know, it's very moving for me to be with Dr. Kellner and, you know, having a conversation and, you know, having a card. Like, a, a, I was, you know, we almost friends. Mm -hmm. It's a very weird <laughs> French kind of... <laughs> friendship, but um, that he doesn't get to do that with his patients, even if he manages to save their life. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, obviously I'm very privileged, I'm white, I'm middle class, I was in New York City mm -hmm. when this happened. Um, and although I was in Brooklyn, when they saw the carnage was in my brain, like, you know, his whole team was paged. They, they got me mm -hmm. from Brooklyn to Mount Sinai West. And, yeah. you know, that, that was, you know, but, but he, we don't know, we can't prove the counterfactual, obviously, but, he thinks because of my life 
in music and my brain in music, yeah. I've been able to rewire and the uh, obviously neuroplasticity is a real thing, but also the ability to to re rewind. But he said it's not just about um, being a musician, it's also just music for anyone could um, benefit. That, I mean, that is something, I'll talk about this more in the, in the next panel, but like I wouldn't call myself a musician at all. And so there's a part of me that's like, how do I get this? Like, I mean, you know, like, um, so you're jealous. I'm jealous of your brain. But you're a dancer. Um, we all have it in our brain. I mean, I know, I was very lucky. My mom had no musical thing in her whole life. You know, she's, her, uh, she's on her own admission tone deaf. My older <laughs> brothers and their half brothers, I think they did maybe recorder when they were like eight. For like, yeah. yeah. My sister threw it out the window one time. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I said yeah. To, to them, have you ever, like, did you actually do the recorder? <laughs> no, they're probably like down the other side of the, like, you know, not, literally not at that point, you know smoking in the like but you know it's the 80s and there was like there was no reason for me to have um a life in music but my you know the dogged toddler in me I said to my mum I want to do this I want to do this I want to do this and I was so moved as I'm sure all of you were last night with Caesar, mm -hmm. no, no. Mm -hmm. um, is that, yeah, I, I did that. Yeah. Um, obviously, on so many levels, um, I was, you know, in bits. Um, but her, him saying that he was called, called mm -hmm. to do this and mm -hmm. lucky enough to do it. And also, I'm so sorry, I was such a good person who remembered everyone's names. It's very good for a journalist and a, and a broadcaster, but now gone. So I've already <laughs> forgot, I forgot the amazing jazz violinist. Is she, um, Regina oh, Carter. Oh my, oh my God, yeah. I'm obsessed. <laughs> She's totally like, um, that, that she also did Suzuki, and I'm, you know, don't, not to say anything about Suzuki, but the whole thing was like, it's in language. Mm -hmm. And you start early when you are forming language in your brain. You know, we know, everyone knows, kind of, that if you learn foreign languages, it's easier when you're four or eight mm -hmm. or six even, or 10, than like 41 or whatever. <laughs> um, so, you know, we sort of know that now, but music is just a language. And I'm sorry to say, I really believe that, that it is a universal language. Yeah. Um, we, last thought, um, unfortunately we're, we're already done almost, um, which is, I'm just curious how you found your way back, if at all, have you reconnected to music? Yeah, I, um, thank you for the question. Um, it was very hard. It's still very difficult for me. I, my, my hearing is fine, but there's something cognitively, everything on my right side is not there at all. So I have no sensation. Um, I can get strength, which is crazy, and also, um, and I think you saw in the the, the, the trailer that, like, I think um, my great friend Nikki came and she became mm. my right hand, and then the really like the circuit connected. Like you felt it to oh, totally. I just didn't know. Everything was wow. so wild <laughs> and so crazy. Um, and I was trying to explain with no words to my husband or my doctors or whatever, like, you know, I just don't even know if music makes sense for me. And I don't know if I could, you know. And at that point, I had no 
you know, there's an absolutely no mobility on my right side at all. So Nikki came, I think it was a, a lockdown in New York City, so it's don't tell anyone. <laughs> but, um, More than two people were gathered you know, at a time. <laughs> um, Nikki and Winton, I was like, okay, I'm, go I'm going to do this. Um, she, she became my, my, uh, my, my bow hand. And although we didn't have the same, like, bowing, so there's lots of, like, stuff that didn't make sense, like, suddenly, oh, hang on a minute. And suddenly, it, like, almost you know, came back. And now I can, you know, I look, I mean, I just can't actually play the bow because the sensation is non, non, like none, <laughs> sorry. And I don't have the strength in my fingers. So I just can't, like, I just can't find, I can't, so I can do really good air <laughs> bar, but I just can't. But I can, you know, if someone can come and do it with me, I can do anything. I mean, yeah. sorry, not, I mean, I, I can play whatever I used to be mm -hmm. able to, which is crazy. That also, is. because, like, that's, I, I, I'm, I wasn't, I mean, I was sort of a professional musician, but I stopped being, like, Particularly, I didn't really practice after like 16, but like after it's still there, everything is there. So it's um, it's crazy and real. Like it's you know, I um, I feel very lucky. So thank you, music. Beautiful. No, to end on lovely. Um, please thank Clemency Burton Hill for joining us. And then I will invite to the stage, we'll, we'll scoot off on this side, but I'm gonna invite to the stage Christopher Bailey, who's the arts and health lead at the World Health Organization. Um, and he's gonna do a performance. So thank you all. Thank you. And then we can go this way. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you till you take my sunshine away the other night, dear, while I was sleeping. I dreamt I held you in my arms. When I awoke, dear, I was mistaken. So I held my head and I cried, you are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you till you take my sunshine away. That was the song that my father sang to me every night to help me go to sleep because I was afraid of the dark. A half a century later, I can still hear the gasp of my ophthalmologist looking through this machine through my eye and seeing my ravaged optic nerve and my heart sank. I asked what was wrong and he said that I had terminal glaucoma. I'd lost over 95% of my vision and I let that sink in and I said, okay, well, um, what's the plan? What's, what's the operation? Uh, what's the drug that I have to take? And he said, well, you can take these beta blocker drops, uh, which will reduce the ocular pressure and slow the progression of the disease, but there's no cure. Okay, so how can I regenerate the optic nerve? You can't. Um, I don't understand. Uh, are you telling me there's no hope? And he said, I don't want you chained to the tyranny of hope. It's not that there's no hope, but the hope isn't wishing this is going to go away, wishing that things that are outside of your control will magically change. You have to change, and you will. Everyone who is in your situation adapts, and in fact transforms. 
physically. And I couldn't really grasp what he was saying. And I did eventually adopt the adaptive technologies like the white cane and the glasses and all that. Uh, and, but still, I was overwhelmed with a sense of loss, of being outcast from the world, pariah, disconnected, because 80% of the way that we engage the world is visual. The visual cortex represents one-fifth of the brain's capacity. To lose that is like a death. Furthermore, I just started this arts and health program, and how was I able, how was I going to be able to accomplish that goal while blind? Putting a blind person in charge of an arts and health program, how you win, right? <laughs> so I began to deal with the grief, with the denial, with the anger, with the bargaining, with the loss. And over time, my feelings began to settle. But of course, what would happen is somebody would come up who hadn't seen me in a while and go, oh, Chris, I heard the news. I'm so sorry. What happened? And I would explain, and they would burst into tears, and I found myself comforting them for my misfortune. And this happened over and over again, and this was beginning to really wear on me after a while. And, and one time, uh, an African colleague uh, whom I love uh, at work came up to me, and, and that happened again, and she said to me, Chris, is there no hope? I thought, well, I, I wouldn't say there's no hope, there's no cure, but uh, so, so there's nothing they can do. There's, there's no operation, there's no medication. No, uh, not yet. Um, and then she paused and she said, well, if there's nothing that the science can offer, maybe I can help. And my warning signals went up. <laughs> Do you believe in Christ? I said, well, I'm pretty sure he existed, you yeah. uh, know. And she said, uh, would you come to church with me and open your mind and see if maybe a miracle could happen because he made the blind see. And I'm already in a very aggravated, end of my rope, angry state, and I was biting my tongue. I didn't want to say what I was thinking. And finally she said, it's just a leap of faith. And I blurted out, every step I take is a leap of faith. God has blinded my eyes. Why in God's name would I want to blind my mind? And she was shocked by what I said, and she fell into my arms. We embraced each other, and we wept for what we perceived was the other's blindness. Looking back at that moment, I realized that I was wrong, that in fact, everything that she said eventually happened. And it happened here in Washington. At around Easter, I had heard that there was a concert of Mozart's Requiem, which I greatly enjoy. And it was at the National Cathedral. And I went in, and I'm listening to this glorious music. And as I'm listening to it, I'm hearing it all, I, I've, I've heard this you know, dozens and dozens of times, but at that moment I heard it differently. I heard the swells of the music and the, the contemplative troughs as almost being the form of grief. And in that moment it represented my loss. And when it swelled to its apex, it seemed uncontrollable, unimaginable. There, it, it seemed like we would never emerge from, from the sadness, and then the grief almost represented the exhaustion afterwards, which sometimes impersonates wisdom. And it would repeat and repeat, just like the grieving process. But more than that representation of the emotions that I was going through, something happened in that moment. And as I listened to the Mozart, it wasn't just the tone and the pitch and the dynamics and the rhythm, 
I began to feel the music passing through the physical environment around me. I began to experience the stone-cold Gothic arches of the cathedral, the, the, the wooden pews, the soft flesh of the people listening, and their clothing. And I began to form an oral image of what was happening around me. It was at that moment that my ability to echolocate kicked in. My brain, my visual cortex, which had been starved of information from my shattered optic nerve, had quietly and slowly been rerouting to my auditory senses. And now it was picking up that information and opening up a new world of sound. It was a strange world, but it had its own beauty. And when you think about it, what is sound? Sound is energy that passes through matter. It passes through me. I feel connected to it. It is, in some ways, more palpable. Vision is light reflecting off of the surface of things. It is, by definition, superficial. So sound was giving me an intimate connection to the people around me and the environment around me that was more immediate, more palpable than vision. And rather than feeling exiled from the world, I began to see my state as an opportunity for profound connection and contemplation without the distraction of sight. That my body, rather than being a prison, had become a womb. And the music itself, the deep aesthetic experience. I, I was reading some Jean-Philippe Rameau a while back, and he's a, he's a Baroque composer. For those of you who don't know, he played the harpsichord, which, which <clears throat> has to play the notes individually. And he wrote about how hearing the note that was just played, hearing the current note, and anticipating the note that has not been played yet, a chord already forms in the mind. And I began to think about that in terms of, of the, the, the temporal centers of the brain and how evolution has given us this ability to create this artificial linearity to time, which has given us a tremendous evolutionary advantage so that we can have a conception of the past that we can learn from and can plan for the future. But it also came at a terrible cost because with that sense of past, came a sense of loss, and with that sense of future came a sense of dread. And there's something about the musical line that weaves together the past, present, and future into a harmonious continuum that music heals broken time. So now, just as you willingly close your eyes to better savor a glass of red wine, just as you willingly close your eyes to better embody a beautiful piece of music, just as you willingly close your eyes to trace the gentle slope of a lover's forearm, so too do I embrace the closing of my eyes to better share this moment with you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. That was so beautiful. Um, I will introduce the new guests that we have on stage, starting at my far left. Obviously, we all know Christopher Bailey, who's the arts and health lead of the World Health Organization. Uh, next up, we have Susan Meg Salmon, who's the founder and executive director of the International Arts and Mind Lab at Johns Hopkins. Welcome. And then we have uh, Charles Lim, who's at UCSF, is a scientist, and is you're now the co-director of the Sound Health Network. Is that correct? Great. And then, of course, Renee Fleming, the creator of the Sound Health Network, amazing opera singer, and um, just here bringing us all together. So let's have a round of applause. Thank everybody. So um, I'm excited to be here today. Uh, to think about, this is the first sound health convening that you guys have had since the pandemic, right? 
so in my mind, I'm thinking, um, while we were all hiding out in our houses, <laughs> what did we miss, right? You know, like, how far has the community of music therapy, even more generally arts therapy, come and where are we sort of stepping towards in these next few months, maybe next year? And so maybe the best place to start is with um, some highlights. And so I'm gonna start with you, Renee, and say, if you think back on, on two years, while, or three years almost, while we were all making um, sourdough breads and TikTok videos, <laughs> like, like to get us through yeah. the pandemic, yeah. what, was, what was happening in this world for you um, with music therapy that really excited you, that you think like, wow, I don't know if anyone saw this. Well, I actually, I, I have to say it was a, a really, it was a catalyst, this whole period. I mean, obviously I lost all my performances, which was originally wonderful. And then uh, six months later, I thought, maybe I'll never perform again. Oh, geez. <laughs> so um, so there were some challenges. And, and of course, the loss is, is catastrophic, the mm -hmm. loss for so many people that I know uh, who, who lost loved ones. However, um, I used the period early in the pandemic to produce uh, 19 episodes called Music uh, and Mind Live. Mm -hmm. And the number of viewers that we got was so astronomical from the number of countries, it was shocking to me. But of course, we had, we had an audience that had nothing else to do. Mm -hmm. And that really made a difference. And I also think that the public, the global public understood suddenly more than they had before how connected we are through artistic expression, and not just music, but all of the arts, and how that went to, came to the forefront. And mm -hmm. I think it was an aha moment for the public and for our field as a whole that, that really catalyzed tremendous change and growth. Right. I felt like I had moments where I was really using Eventbrite which is like, you, you can find like free events online. And I was like, give me a comedy show. You say someone dancing in their studio apartment somewhere, you know, like let me engage with someone in that way. Everyone's nodding. We also, you yeah. Know, yeah, yeah. Um, Susan, you uh, were part of something. So at the, at the NeuroArts Initiative, um, I was really interested in this report that you guys came out with. I think it's called Blueprint. Um, can you tell us more about that? Because it really digs into some of the, the evidence and um, supports a, around music therapy. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so yeah, the, the pandemic was so crazy. Um, I danced more, which I thought was really great. Oh, nice. Um, we have a Friday night dance party. Um, but I can we come? Sure. Is it on? Is yeah. it on Zoom? Yeah. It's just my husband <laughs> and me. <laughs> but you can come. Um, but you know, I thought um, when the pandemic sort of sent us to our rooms, and I, you know, eventually cleaned my bedroom, I cleaned the house, and then um, I had started this project with the Aspen Institute called the Neuro Arts Blueprint. And it was an inquiry before the pandemic. You know, there was so much happening with the arts all over the world and um, had gotten to know Christopher Bailey and um, Charles and I go way back and um, started to think a lot about um, the arts were everywhere, but in some ways they were nowhere because the truth of the matter is there really is not a through line to a virtuous cycle of policy and sustainability. Um, there's so much art everywhere, but it is often at the goodwill of the artist and I think people that are, are using the arts in churches and in community centers mm. and individually. Um, we, you know, we write poetry, we create sculpture. Um, and, uh, and for myself, I'm not, I think of myself as not an artist, but as an art maker. And so I've never been trained in art. I'm a twin, my sister's an artist. But um, I love the arts as a maker and a beholder, but I'm not a skilled artist yet. It's given me so much amazing um, strength and support mm. throughout my life in lots of different ways. So the blueprint was a way to talk to people all over the world for two years. And it turned out that it was the two years we were in the pandemic. So we got to talk to a lot more people than I think we would have. Um, literally thousands of people through surveys and in interviews and gatherings. <laughs> and this is like people just like the people Artists, in this room. Artists, okay. practitioners, researchers, mm -hmm. uh, policymakers, funders. And what we heard was that there was this was the time, the moment was ripe to be able to really 
really create what Renee calls a field to really think about how do we bring creative arts therapists, music therapists, but also arts and health folks, rehabilitation people, psychologists, social workers, public health. And the arts are everywhere and there's a lot of people that are creating them and doing them. And so the blueprint really outlines five recommendations, research and evidence being a huge one, looking very deeply at infrastructure for the field, and then also thinking about how we look at how do we communicate this both within the field and outside of the mm -hmm. field to the general public. So what Sound Health is doing here is a big part of that. I think it weaves all of those threads together in sharing research, talking about practice, and also how do we use this work in our daily lives and how do we make it a thing? How do we really make it sustainable? Mm -hmm. And so there'll be a lot more conversations over the last next couple of years about policy and funding at a workplace level, federal level, state level, community level, global level, and how do we really kind of keep this going? Yeah, and had anything like Blueprint been done before as far as really digging into all of the different aspects of this field? Well, the Sound Health Network, mm -hmm. I think, is a pioneer mm -hmm. in terms of really looking at the way music and sound wor really work with us. So Sound Health has been looking at research. Sound Health has been looking at practitioners, looking at ways to connect folks. The NeuroArts Blueprint is bigger in the sense that it's looking at all the art forms across the world and really trying to really look at this as a kind of global structure and global movement. Mm -hmm. um, but I think over time, there's always been interest and movement towards this, but I don't think the science was there, and mm. I think you heard earlier from several people that the science is really catching up with the artists. You mm -hmm. know, it's, we knew this, right? Yeah. Artists have known this, but the science is important because you can get very granular about different diseases and disorders around different kinds of ways to look at mental health, and also flourishing and thriving. I, I, Christopher can say this better than I can, but the World Health Organization's mission isn't about just distinct, extinguishing disease, but it's about how we thrive and yeah. how we grow and how we live our lives to the ultimate potential. And I think that's what we want. Yeah, it's kind of like thinking about health as like, um, it's almost like you're, uh, when you go into your, your GP like once a year and you get your like annual checkup, it's like, how can we think about things ahead of time and not just be dealing with disaster situations? Yeah, it's not the absence after. of disease, right? Right, yeah. right. Chris, do you wanna jump in and talk about um, the ways in which you've moved through the last two years in the World Health Organization well, is can, thinking uh, about evidence. Yeah. I can give you um, many concrete examples. I'll choose one of uh, what Susan was describing. Yeah, please. Uh, the, the cycle between research practice and policy. Uh, there was a very small program uh, a while back in the UK, which has been a pioneer in social prescribing. Uh, oh. uh, it was called Music for Mums. And it, it was a, a couple of hospitals looking at the use of music and singing and group singing uh, to combat postpartum depression. And the results yeah. were phenomenally good. So uh, through WHO, our Copenhagen office, uh, we were able to get national pilots in Denmark and Romania. Mm -hmm. And even before the final numbers came out, because it was so positive, Italy has now joined. And the EU has been part of the whole process from the beginning. So if the numbers turn out to be as successful as we think, it's going to be rolled out officially uh, across the continent. And, uh, and, and with the power of government and nationalized health systems, mm -hmm. um, it, it will be available to everybody who needs it and, and be funded. Um, that's a European example. In America, for instance, it's a little more circuitous. Um, as, as we are. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, but, but, but from a WHO perspective, you know, we don't judge these things. We say, okay, um, if we want to affect policy, who actually makes policy? Mm -hmm. And in the US, it's not necessarily the government. It's mm -hmm. insurance companies. It's uh, the big hospital systems. And so the type of evidence that you look for needs to be tailored. So uh, what, what is it that's going to make a, an insurance company pay for a program like that? Well, if you can show not just that it's effective at combating depression, but um, it reduces the amount of hospital care that person needs and the discharge is earlier and it's more efficient to the system, that's a very powerful argument. And, and are we seeing things like that? Yeah. 
Yeah, and, uh, and like I said, this is one of dozens of examples out there of, of that sort of thing. Now, having said that, I also wanna put in a cautionary note of, and it gets to what uh, Susan was talking about, um, health being uh, a, well, I'll give you the, the exact definition uh, from our 1947 constitution. <laughs> health is not merely the absence of disease and infirmity, but the attainment of the highest level of physical, mental, and social well-being. And uh, the, the mental health corollary to that is that mental health is not merely the absence of a mental illness diagnosis or condition, but your ability to cope, your ability to uh, achieve the highest level of, of uh, practicing your abilities, of being productive, of being part of a community, of finding moments of joy. If you can do all of these things, you are mentally healthy regardless of what diagnosable conditions you may or may not have. And once you frame it that way, it is so liberating because people with depression, for instance, um, they can tell you that it's something you live with your entire life. You, you can get medicated for it, but you don't actually cure it. And, and the, the arts, and this is the problem with measurement, to, to look at the other side of it, is that sometimes uh, it gives the false impression that we are trying to eliminate the condition rather than helping people thrive. And that's the difference between curing and healing. Mm -hmm. and, and it's an important distinction. Um, when we talk about stress levels, for instance, uh, it's really because we can measure cortisol. And that's just an indicator of other, of other things that are happening. The goal isn't to eliminate all stress in our lives, I don't think. Um, but if looking at stress helps us find secrets to how we can cope with stress productively and, and function, then that's, that's useful. Right. But, uh, but it's finding those asset measures, not just the deficit measures, and, and uh, not getting too bound up in a mechanized view of it. Yeah. Charles, do you want to um, sort of dive a little more into social prescribing? And as someone who is like a doctor, you know, who works with patients, you're, you do head and neck surgery. I'm curious, like the ways in which you could see that being part of uh, a practice or a treatment? Yeah, let me try. Um, <laughs> first, I did make sourdough bread um, very, Thank very you. badly. Yeah. Remind me why I didn't become a musician or a baker. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I would tell you that as a clinician or a surgeon during the pandemic, it was really a time of, of mass confusion at the very beginning. And yeah, I remember very clearly trying to explain to my kids why I was going to work, even though everybody else was was staying home, yeah. and how I didn't really know what was going to happen. They're like, like, what's going on? I was like, I had no idea what was going to happen that day. I didn't know when I was going to get COVID. I didn't know. Like, we did, we were making things up. Like, literally in the hospital, we were making things up, and so all of us were just trying to figure it out. And so <clears throat> I had kind of this duality in my life where. It, you know, it's there are reckonings. You know, you, you go through personal, professional moments where you kind of really have to take stock of yourself and your situation. I'm, I'm sure all of you have had this. And for me, for me, that was a reckoning where I was like, okay, well, this is actually why I became a doctor. You know, as opposed to trying to be comfortable and safe, I accepted cool. many years ago that I'd actually have to be maybe taking a risk and was actually just never put in a position where I had to take a risk. As, you know, I just think the duality of that, of like wanting to flee, like it's like the rest, everyone else is retreating and you're like, oh, I want to go out, but I have to go in. Yeah. Yeah. And what, but what I really wanted was information. I wanted data. Mm -hmm. I wanted science. I wanted to really know what was real and what was not real. Yeah. And it was hard to arrive at that information. And so, you know, you just kind of accept it as a, as a physician that you are sort of going in to provide a service to the best of your ability. And that was actually in a funny way even though everybody else was quarantined and felt safe, I was very glad to see my work colleagues. Mm -hmm. So even though we were all masked and had multiple layers of PPE on, we were able to talk to each other in person. Mm -hmm. And so in my clinical life, like my day, it's my day job is as a surgeon, but in my kind of academic research world, a couple of interesting things were happening. First of all, the Sound Health Network was actually formed before the pandemic. Mm. And a lot of this was due to the efforts of Renee, due to the efforts of Francis Collins, but also for several people in this room. So Sunil Iyengar from the National Endowment for the Arts, absolutely pivotal for the Sound Health Network. Thank you, Sunil. <laughs> but then also sitting immediately to Sunil's right is uh, Dr. Julian Johnson. I'll tell you, the Sound Health Network would not exist without Julian Johnson. Mm -hmm. And then two other people, Sherry Robb, who has been representing our musical therapy arm of the Sound Health Network, and then 
And Indre Viscontis, who many, many of you met last night, who's the communications lead for the uh, uh, Sound Health Network. And, and last, but probably first, is Stephanie Purnell, who's been our main coordinator uh, for the Sound Health Network. So, so what happened was we had this period where, you know, obviously everybody's having Zoom meetings, but we kind of consolidated in a way. Like, you know, we got to define who we were and what we were about and try to actually, you know, we're, it's funny because people are dying around, like, by the, in the end, millions of people died. And so yeah. during this, people of, this period of time, we're still trying to figure out how music in, is relevant and how the research you is were, relevant. that didn't like, I can imagine a world in which that, you're just like, I, what am I dealing with right now, today? You know, to have this like sense of presence of mind to go like, okay, this is still important. I'm carrying this with me in the chaos. That's very interesting to me. Yeah, because you know what we realized that, you know, people still, despite the pandemic, people, we're, we're still humans. Yeah. And we still care about the same things that we cared about, just in a slightly different form. And so scientists, unlike clinicians who were not, in the hospital, we're actually able to, to put out a lot of papers. Actually, a lot of research was submitted to journals in, in record numbers. Mm. People were finishing off projects that they hadn't done. Um, and, and it was kind of, kind of interesting to see that kind of thing happen. I think for the, us at the Sound Health Network, it was really a way to kind of just, I think, formulate who we are, what we want to be, and maybe make it a little more pragmatic. Mm -hmm. You know, not just think about it as like, art as this kind of like thing you put on a pedestal, but for something we need on a very mundane day-to-day -day level to feel human. You know, I, I can't tell you how, how affected I was by watching Clemency and hearing her story. And, you know, I think it just gave me an example of, this is not academic material, even though it can be academic, it has academics attached to it. This is real world stuff that we think about and we need to actually be alive. Yeah, I was really struck. How many people here got to go to the, to the event last night? It was just, I, I was really struck by, um, I was saying this to Renee, like I cried a few times. I was just really struck by, I think, especially as I, you know, I'm a journalist and I did science and I prepare for events and stuff. You think about all of the intellectual stuff and then you go to this event and you're like, oh my God, the humanity, you know, the humanity in this whole story is, is, really, is really quite moving. Um, Renee, I'm curious, like, how, yeah, I'm curious in the ways in which you kept this moving forward over the last, over the last three years. Like, who did you bump into um, that you were like, oh, this, this person or this thing that someone's trying is so interesting. How do I get them out into the world? Well, um, you know, this past year I went, I was touring again, but twice as much as usual. Wow. <laughs> it was just folding in all the missed performances into the new performances. It's been really challenging. But um, what I see now when I present, because I typically, when I'm doing a concert somewhere, I'll actually invite scientists to present with me and just do kind of an so overview. Cool. And audiences come and they love it. You know, it's the same thing. It's like, oh, wow, this is why this works. This is why, oh, this is why that is meaningful to me. And mm -hmm. this is, oh, that can affect these disorders. And we see two major problems in, right now in the world. One is a mental health crisis that is just exploding. Um, and I think some of this really is, is connected to this isolation, uh, social isola isolation that we've had recently. And it was increasing before then, especially for young people. Uh, and the other thing I think that's been uh, really crucial for me is connecting with Susan, because this neural arts blueprint is so ambitious. She's, she always is, she, not, she doesn't, give it, explain this, what it means to create a new field. Nobody <laughs> knew what climate was 20 years ago. Right. It's fully accepted, it's a field, and now Mother Nature is like sort of hitting home, you know, it's like the home run, yeah. it's like, yeah, this is real people, yeah. people. You don't hear the deniers talking too much lately, do we? So it's the same thing, it's if, if Susan can, uh, if the neural arts blueprint can achieve this, this kind of consolidation of all of the silos that currently exist, this is being practiced, as she said, everywhere, but in little tiny pockets, in community yeah. centers, and, and, uh, um, and certainly healthcare providers are starting to get it. You know, hospitals are getting it because it's so additive, what they're trying to do really is helped by the support that arts therapists can bring and art um, and music medicine as well these we're if I go in and sing in a hospital setting I'm practicing music medicine I'm not a licensed therapist mm -hmm. and they're very different disciplines that work nicely side by side I think so I think that's been very exciting and what we're trying to do right now 
is, is work to create some sort of technology that brings the power of, of uh, breathing exercises and singing to long COVID patients. Mm -hmm. So I saw two grown men break down on a Zoom call crying mm -hmm. because they were hit badly with COVID early on and couldn't breathe. And pulmonologists, their own doctor said, there's nothing more we can do for you. We're really sorry. And they told one of these guys who was young, you've got about four years to live. So wow. get your things in order. They connected somehow. They saw the English National Opera piece early on. They said, singing, maybe that can help. They connected to LA Opera, which started also a kind of a singing program through UCLA and sang in a group for six weeks. They didn't just improve their breathing and ability to speak, they, they, get, they got hope. They got a sense of community with the other patients who were suffering equally, mm -hmm. and they're so grateful. And yeah. so we're trying to really expand that kind of program, because long COVID is, is uh, pervasive. There's so many people still struggling. Yeah, a few of my friends, indeed. I, it's really interesting when you bring breath into this conversation for me, because I think, um, you know, I feel like I'm from like Midwestern, middle class Ohio. Arts to me seems like a, a almost like a barrier to entry. Like I don't feel like fancy enough for arts. It's the word, isn't and, it? And 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 We've I gotta and find I, a new word. And I come up against this with like science reporting a lot. Like science, like you don't know what to do with that. It really <laughs> turns everybody off. So I'm like, okay, let's try and do a story where there's no science. Like we don't say science at all. Um, and so I guess I just, so, so to me, when I hear you say breath or, or Chris, you talk about, um, you know, go, go stand in nature, go sing in a community of people, um, that feels really eye opening to me. So I wonder if we can just like throw arts aside for a second and like pull apart what we mean, what we mean by that and how I can touch it more. Susan, so the mic is up. You She's me, ready, and you then make I'll me go think around. about this. Um, there's a fire station in Virginia, not far from here, where they have a creative arts therapist, and they doodle. They, they doodle. doodle. That's the way they started because doodling is a form of, of visual art, right? And it helped them to be able to really move some of the energy through yeah. of coming back from a bad tour. They weld. They write poetry, some of them. Um, they do videos. They, it's, I think when you get away from the word art and yeah. you start, you know, they square dance. You know, yeah. they do things that we all do in our own cultures, in our own families, in our own way, but they don't rarefy it to art and that you have to develop a skill and be really great at it. And I think the physiological and psychological benefits of something as simple as humming, you know. Really? I, I, something I'm as tone simple deaf. as humming? Yeah, I'm tone deaf. And I sing all the time to the chagrin of everyone around me. <laughs> um, 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 but, but, it, but it makes me happy, right? Yeah. And so I think we undervalue those really simple things that we can do by ourselves listening to the radio in the car. I mean, singing in the car. All that stuff is art. Yeah. You know, whether you're the beholder or the maker, there's benefits. And the benefits are different depending upon what you're trying to go at. But it's yeah, If you it's have good. ideas about language, please tell yeah. us. Creativity, I mean, they're... Expression. 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 Thank you. Expression. Thank you. Yeah, because I think about that too, like, what is... Um, do I do I have to be do I have to be singing or can I be uh, absorbing singing? You know, do I have to be the sculptor or can I like go to a museum and be like, this is this is beautiful? Like, is is that equally healing or if not equally, is it a type of healing? Absolutely. Yeah. There's no the dualities. I think when you take get away from that, it's yes and yeah. You know, there it's both, and I think it depends on what you're needing. That's yeah. really important too. And demystifying so much of those things is really important in the field. I can't tell you how looking out the it window makes me. is healing to me. Looking out the yeah. window at this native landscape. It's so good. It's beauty. It's yeah. beauty. Well, in fact, there's some data uh, in hospital recovery of uh, being able to look out the window at green space uh, increases the recovery time. Yeah. This, I remember um, working, you guys might have it, I remember working in a, uh, when I lived in Cleveland, I was a volunteer at university hospitals in the cancer center, and I remember I would work in the kids' ward, and it was like, there were artists and dogs and colors and like all of this stuff, and then I would go to the adults, 
and it was like white walls and no windows. And I was like, but I'm still the same body that I was when I was five, whether I'm 18 or 35 or 65. Like why would one part, why would the five-year-old want color or expression, but the 65-year-old doesn't, right? I can answer that question. Please, Chris. Uh, it's not that the 65-year-old doesn't want color. Uh, what happened was uh, throughout the history of hospitals, there's always been art on the wall. Uh, and uh, you can go back to uh, the 13th century in Italy and uh, some of the early masters painting these amazing murals in, in the hospitals. And all, all the way through the 19th century with uh, Florence Nightingale actually writing about it and the University of Leeds Hospital in the 19th century uh, um, having um, putting art everywhere. And it was only in the 1920s with the Bauhaus movement and the less is more philosophy that it was all stripped away. Really? And the only thinking around it was it seemed symbolic of an antiseptic space, which of course biologically makes no sense because the germ doesn't care whether there's paint on the wall, <laughs> right? Um, and, and, and so when people come to me, uh, part of our program, we have a... Um, uh, a hospital rooms program where we commission artists to work with patients and clinicians and create these murals mm -hmm. in clinical spaces. And uh, we're, we're often challenged to present the data, which we're happy to do. We team with academic institutions. But I also say to these people, um, where was the data when you stripped out the decoration? Oh. Uh, where was the logic, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, did, did anyone bother to actually check whether stripping visual information was going to improve um, the, the patient experience? Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, I don't know about you, how many people have been in a hospital? Like for an op, oh, well, exactly. And, and you remember that feeling when you're coming out of an operation where suddenly you, you, you don't feel like your body is a safe place anymore and it's yeah. almost like your spirit is outside and, and you need a vase of flowers, you need a painting on the wall, you need a tree in the window as a tether to, to bring your spirit back into your body as a safe place. It's called dissociation. And um, so these are, these are real concepts. And, and when we stripped the hospital room of these things, uh, we, we did the patients a disservice and it, it's, yeah, I, I, feel, I feel very strongly about this one. Mm -hmm. uh, good, I do too. Um, <laughs> Charles, uh, what does your hospital look like? No, <laughs> <laughs> no pressure, no. Um, I, I, a lot of Jackson Pollock. A lot of Jackson Pollock, really? Interesting. Oh, I was like, everyone go to Charles' yeah. hospital. He's in San Francisco. Um, but, but that is an important point because yeah. some of the largest public art collections are in hospital yeah. systems. And I, I have a, a group of friends that are do, they do um, like mini museums. It's called, they're called like micro museums. And they've been putting them in hospitals. And they're these amazing kind of engineering artistic installations that at every level has something. So you can be tall, you can be a small person, you know, you're, you're engaged on this whole thing. And they put them in lobbies and they just had huge success in um, New York and Detroit and like different places. Uh, but Charles, seriously. Um, I feel like a lot of the conversation kind of centers around the brain, like um, how, the, how the brain interacts with art, how the brain, how, you know, I think about Clemmie was talking about the rewiring, the neuroplasticity, and I wonder what parts of this conversation are really brain-based and what are just like full body, like if I can cut the brain off for a second, like, like, uh, is it all about rewiring the brain and how the brain interacts with all these things? Or is there, is there, are there hormones going on? Are there, is there something great, physiological, cellular, you know, you don't, you know, you're not God. I know you don't know everything, but I throw yeah, that at you. Well, I'm not a fan of decapitation. Um, <laughs> uh, so l let me or say I this. Got no body. Yeah, exactly. I mean, <laughs> Obviously, it's not all the brain, but also, obviously, you cannot contemplate human existence without the brain. Yeah. And so I guess the way I think about this from a hospital perspective is that we're just not that good yet at taking care of people. Like, we are just other people trying to help people. Yeah. We know a little bit more about disease and what to do about it, mm -hmm. but we don't know how to make your lives perfect. 
and we don't know how to heal perfectly. And there's a resource constraint, there's a time constraint, and everybody is just trying to do their best. It takes like decades of your life to learn how to do surgery, and you're also supposed to think about the paintings on the wall. And so <laughs> what happens is everybody just kind of like corners into their thing. This yeah. is what I do. And you almost don't take responsibility for what else is happening in the rest of the building because that's not your job. Your job is to do what you're trained to do. And you hope that you're doing it really well. And so then, you know, it's, it's funny, the more, as, as I think a lot of the scientists in the room might feel this way, the more I study the brain, sometimes I think of people as just brains walking around, <laughs> and then they're like, they have this like tiny little spinal cord that connects their brains to their bodies. And so I think <laughs> this whole embodied consciousness in psychology is a real thing. Um, sometimes I tend to ignore it, but then when I think about my own life, of course, you, how can you separate your brain from your body? It's, it's essential to who you are. You're, you don't feel well if your body doesn't feel well. But on the other hand, your brain is the key conduit, right? So everything you do in this life, all of your input and output is fundamentally mediated through your brain. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously there's nobody that can really exist without their brain. You yeah. can exist without your feet or your arms, but you cannot exist without your brain. You can I think it's worth saying, too, that it's the technology that's helped us understand the power of the arts, looking at the brain, right? And that's recent. Yeah, it's, a, been ex I mean, it's really enabled questions that were off limits. I mean, the arts, as you said, used to be this rarefied thing. I don't myself think about it that way. Okay, mm -hmm. I feel like the arts are, it's like everything else in the world except like our daily mundane tasks. It's, it's the ultimate expression of human emotion. Yeah. And language work, these things are not always that good at, at allowing us to handle and process mm. and communicate emotions. Mm -hmm. And you know, we talked a little bit about the input-output arcs. So yes, there's a perceptual component. We're all taking information in, and this is what our brain's doing. But we're also reflecting it back out. Right? And so that, to me, is, I think, everyday life. That's what it means to be human. So I don't view that aspect of whether it's viewing art or producing art as rarefied. I don't mm. view it as elite. I don't think you need a certain amount of training or education to participate. I feel like you need to exist to find that important. And off of Renee's point, do you, um, are there, just to dig in some, to some of the evidence, and maybe you were thinking of something specific too, so please jump in anybody. Um, but like, what is some of the new things that we're seeing? Like, what are we seeing if we look into an fMRI and someone's doodling? You know, and maybe that's too basic of an experiment, but like, I'm just curious, yeah. like, what is some of the stuff that we're seeing? Well, I had, uh, I had an, uh, uh, an experiment at the NIH, actually, that looked at my brain um, for two hours in the machine, singing, imagining singing, and speaking. Oh, really? And imagining singing was the most powerful. It affected more parts of the brain than the really? other activities, which surprised the group of scientists. You were one of them who was looking at <laughs> the scan, the, the results. So these are the kinds of things. When I met Francis Collins and I said, why are scientists looking at music? And he said, it's because we want to understand the brain. It's the Brain Institute at the NIH. But um, I think the nervous system is important now, too, and I'm only just learning about that. How long, uh, both of you, have we known about the power of the nervous system, for instance, to feel rhythm before we do, before we're consciously aware of it? Well, a slightly different point, which is that I think the interdisciplinary aspect of this is also really important. So, you know, it's neuroscience, but I think it's also um, cardiology and people that are studying the endocrine system and people that are studying all these different systems coming together to really start to get a bead on what's really physiologically happening. Mm. And I think that's new, and that's part of what this field is trying to do, too, is to not only keep it into sort of what do we know about the brain, but what do we know about how the systems work together? And it makes me think about touch, right? You know, when you touch somebody or something, the millions of synapses that are triggering your brain, your somatosensory system, and helping you understand what you're touching and how you're touching yeah. it, and how if you're touching a child, how that changes the neurochemicals throughout your body, right? So that's not one discipline. That's many people, or how pain, touch and pain work. So I think bringing people together is also really important in this time. Let me, let me put a cautionary comment in about science, okay? So I was waiting I, for this. Well, I think that we need to be a little bit careful. Like, there's a tendency for um, non-scientists, I think, to romanticize science a little bit, mm -hmm. whereas scientists don't do that. In fact, scientists are the most critical about science, as we should be. We don't want to accept information unless we're absolutely sure that it's correct. And 
science doesn't work by storytelling, right? And this kind of field often sort of spreads fire, catches fire by storytelling. And so there's a little bit of disconnect where scientists can get skeptical of too much talk. And the reason that's the case is because science is incremental data layered upon incremental data mm -hmm. that's been kind of validated and verified. And so we don't want the shortcut simple answer. Mm -hmm. And so like even, like I hate talking about my own work sometimes because it's so early. And when we're talking about something like the, the science of the arts, it's a really great romantic concept, but the science is in its infancy. And to say that somehow we can explain these complex things that pertain to what it means to be alive, it's very lofty. And so I would suggest that we're really, really at the beginning. And this is why we need a field of rigorous research that's interdisciplinary. We need all of the voices, but we actually need science to be driving the research part of it so that it can be done right. And yeah. this is why I think the NIH has been so critical in sort of saying this is a valid topic for study. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look. I, I want to add to that. And then Chris, we'll, and there get, we'll get no, you too, for There's sure. no real money on the table. You know, when you really think about how much money is spent for Alzheimer's or for other kinds of diseases and disorders compared to what's spent on the arts, it's pennies. And I think that's super important to do the science. I also think there's lots of ways of knowing besides science. And I think we have to make sure that. that there's room for that at the table. Um, and I think it's also really important to, to, to make sure that those voices are not adjunct, but are part of that from the very beginning. I think that's really, yeah. really important. Yeah, love that. Well, Chris. I think um, <clears throat> a story does not make something true, right? But it makes it understood. And, uh, and that's an important distinction, because the same scientists who uh, are saying, I don't want to say it until I'm 99% sure and it's reproducible and all of that, uh, then stop there. And then they wonder, well, I presented my data. Why doesn't the public actually change their behavior? It's because it's not connected to a story that they understand. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's, that's part of what we're doing as well, is uh, creating narratives that can speak to both worlds that are science-based uh, and, and understanding the difference and, and uh, working in that space in good faith. Uh, Completely but, agree. Yeah. The other thing is, um, in terms of the money, for instance, one of the goals of our WHO program is through uh, this lab that we're creating and this network of uh, collaborating centers around the world, of which uh, S Susan's uh, program is uh, in the pipeline, um, we want to, uh, I, I've already drawn up an agreement with UNESCO where in a few years we're going to gather together the very first meeting ever of all the ministers of health and all the ministers of culture and present the evidence with uh, policy recommendations. And the idea there is to unlock a global investment in the arts specifically uh, for the health of communities. And um, that's the goal. Uh, and so rather than sort of piddling on this little grant here, or that little mm. grant there to, to go for the, the, the big game. Uh, but I, 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 I want to take the conversation back to the essential. I'm, I'm going to argue for use of the word art. Oh. Um, I think the only reason it's become stigmatized has nothing to do with art. It has to do with the over commodification of people and goods, uh, right? Uh, that uh, after the Industrial Revolution, the family began to break down, and families and communities sang together. They, they joked together. They told stories together. And uh, th suddenly, the arts became something specialized that you only did if you could commodify it. And, and I look at the people in the arts and health field, and I, I, they fall into two categories. They're the clinicians and the public health professionals who got tired of seeing patients as just simply cogs in an assembly line that you have to get through as cheaply as possible uh, to get paid, uh, and artists who got tired of being objectified themselves, where their, their bodies and their products were only as valuable as people's willingness to pay money for it. And, and so suddenly we have this field where the objectives are, have totally transformed, where in, in both cases, here's what it's about. When a doctor sees a patient, the doctor asks, what's the matter with you? When an artist sees a patient, the artist says, what matters to you? 
It's not enough just simply to live longer or to get out of the hospital faster. That life has to be worth living. And, and that's what we bring to the table. That's what we mean by thriving. It's not just the absence of disease. It's living in a just society. It's finding joy. It's, it's, it's finding completion and, and a sense of community. And, and I mean, what we need is, frankly, a, a revolution of the heart. Mm. Yeah. Susan? Were you just nodding, or did you? No, I was just thinking about um, the, when you think, and I'm all for um, pharmacological interventions, and I think they're super important in combination with things like the arts. And, um, you know, we don't know how a lot of drugs work on our brains, yet the FDA yeah. approves them, right? Yeah. And I feel like there needs to be mechanisms to approve different kinds of arts interventions so that they can get the funding that, that right. we need, both on the research side and on the prescription side. Um, and th there's a project that we're working on with the Blueprint right now on Alzheimer's, and we're looking at music. We did an economic analysis, and we saw that there is a three-to-one return on the financial ROI when you use music with an Alzheimer's patient. Wait, so break that down for me. So it basically means that it costs significantly less to use that kind of intervention. There's less medication. There's less patient care. There's less um, family loss of work. So looking at different variables. Like, in, like just to make sure I understand this, like in a way, if you apply music therapy to an Alzheimer's patient, you see that either disease progression adjusts or, or medicine works better? Not or, disease progression, okay. but quality of life changes okay. dramatically. And there's a cascade of factors that have economic impact on that. So okay. there's less staff time. There's less medication sometimes. There's less... Um, away time from work for the family member, for example. Yeah. There's less mental health issues. So we looked at this economic analysis. Now we're doing something called a true value analysis, which mm. is how does it affect the society? How does it affect the culture? Yeah. Um, what we need to be able to go to someone like the CMS or other healthcare providers mm -hmm. that are paying for healthcare um, benefits is to be able to show that the research, the basic yeah. science research is there. So there's a lot of studies. They're very broad and not so deep. There haven't really been any multi-site clinical trials, mm -hmm. which is a gold standard in, in science. Right. And so you know, I think the arts are really trying to figure out what is the minimum threshold for arts interventions being able to meet the criteria for reimbursement, uh -huh. because that's super important. And that's going to change the practitioners in the field. That's yeah. going to change the pipeline for the students coming into the field. Because if you can't get paid for something that you're going to school for, you're probably not going to go to school for it. Right. right? What was that number? The it's a three to one return. That's amazing. That's incredible. And, and I that think report, that will speak to insurance companies who are, as Chris pointed out, are really at the top dog in terms of deciding who gets what uh, therapy. Yeah, I kept thinking this is a very US argument. It's True. Very it, and the other argument, I think, that I think against the word art in the U.S. and definitely in the U.K. is the, the elitism, that people associate the word art with elitism. Yeah. And until we can combat that, you know, which it, is why I'm looking for new language. It, it's a shame because I, I always go to the etymology, and art comes from the Latin. It just basically means to create with a skill or technique. So when, when you follow your mother's recipe for chicken cacciatore and add a bit of cinnamon instead of basil, you, you've, that's, that's art. I mean, when, when you uh, ar arrange your environment at home to make it more nurturing and pleasant, that's art. When you um, walk down the street with intention owning the space around you, that's art. You Does know. it matter that I'm not successful when I try to do those things in, <laughs> in cooking? I love that. Yeah, you <laughs> said ten skill, times. and I was like, ooh, that's where I may lose you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a product of the Industrial Revolution. That's, because, yeah, uh, there's a lot of cultural pressure in yeah. that. There's the Susan rubbish choir that I belong to where you can sing off tune. Yeah. <laughs> oh, really? No, I, I, I only have one musical talent, uh, like, like Susan. Uh, I, I'm not particularly artistic in any way, but here's my musical talent. That's the one thing I can do. Charles. Well, I feel like 
you only need to look at children. You know, children are not elite. They are not snobby. They're mm -hmm. just born. Yeah. And bef before you know it, they're doing art. It's just, we're hardwired. Humans are hardwired to create. Yeah. It's interesting. We're sort of going down the line. And unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap soon. But I love everyone keeps leaning forward. They can, people are getting more excited in this, in this, in this panel. Well, I, I do want to make one intervention because we never talk about it in these discussions. And it, it's such an important part of everything that we're talking about. And that's humor. Yeah, it's all so damn serious. And uh, we, we, we need to remember that when we talk about uh, pediatric oncology units and all that, the most effective intervention there is a clown. You know, and, and the healing power of the laugh, bringing us back to the, the present moment and, and connection and uh, all of those things. Uh, and it, I, I, I just want to make another that. bid to keep humor in the conversation. Yeah, I like that. That's because they haven't seen it yet. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, traumatizing. traumatizing. It's the media. Traumatizing. <laughs> uh, Charles, what is something, I mean, we're having this great sort of organic down the line of uh, things that could advance the field, right? We're thinking about reimbursements. How do we get things approved in the same way we would get like a drug approved? A change of heart. Do we use a new word? I wonder what you'd throw into the mix as in the next few years, what, you'd, what yeah, you would so see. Yeah, so let me speak on behalf of the Sound Health Network a little bit. Um, first of all, we're grateful for your presence and interest here. We're grateful for your engagement. I think what we need is science that takes the form of meaningful collaboration. And so what I mean by that is scientists alone cannot figure out which questions are the most relevant to artists or to patients, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that music therapists, but also musicians and interested scientists need to form teams mm. to take on substantive projects that are funded by high level research funding agencies so they'll have a, the credibility and the backing of actual science. That's mm -hmm. what I would love to see happen in the next five to 10 years. That's amazing. Or sooner. That's amazing. Final thought? All right, we'll work on that. We'll work on that. Yes. Thanks, Renee. <laughs> UCLA wants partners, by the way, and they've had trouble getting them in the system closer to LA, just saying. Um, so for me, I, I do. I, one of the things that I'm trying to do is support this initiative that will enable uh, trained performers, um, people who are at the top conservatories, to also receive a certificate so they can work in a healthcare environment. Because, oh, wow. right, yeah, because yeah. that would now the only thing that exists for people who've had this, this conservatory education across the country, everywhere I teach, I say, how many of you will have debt when you leave this school? It's 90% <laughs> of the students raise hands their up, hands, yeah. and they're trying to be performers. I said, please double major right now, double major, because it's right. tough out there for performers. But if this gives them another opportunity, another way of using their art for good, um, teaching is, of course, has always been there as a possibility, um, maybe even arts administration, but working in a healthcare setting is extremely, I'd think, satisfying. It's a wonderful way to give back. So we're working on that. Okay, so certificate of health, collaboration, so on the blueprint, getting things into the field. Sure, yeah. on the blueprint side, we have a five year plan to really make this field the foundation that it needs. And so we're enter ending the first year and we'll have a progress report out in January. Mm -hmm. And we've got a really ambitious next four years that includes um, more research, working with practitioners, um, also thinking more deeply around policy and funders and communication. So we'll be bringing that out, um, working with many of the folks that are in this room and really excited about it. Wonderful. Can, you, can we just have a round of applause? We're gonna have to wrap. Christopher Bailey, Susan McNamon, Charles Lynn, Renee Fleming, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you, thank you.